Well, welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we are continuing our series on Christology. Today, we're going to be discussing a passage in the Old Testament, specifically Exodus. And I'm excited about this, Kevin, because there we, we've had a, we did a podcast episode on, you know, Jesus is the nice, loving New Testament God. And then the Old Testament God is like the, the father who's mean and angry all the time. And so we've, we've talked about how that's false, but it is still difficult, I think, for many of us to read the Old Testament and see, well, see Jesus in it. So as we're talking about reading scripture itself Christologically with a focus on Christ, uh, reading it through the lens of Jesus, there's lots of different phrases that we've used uh, throughout this podcast on how, how we do what we do, how we read scripture. Well, we're going to talk about Exodus, which doesn't mention Jesus at all, and yet he's kind of everywhere, isn't he? Yeah, it, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't mention him, but he does. But it does. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Exodus thirty-four specifically, verses six, six, well, and seven too. Mostly just six. Mostly six, but yeah, like the sentence continues into seven. I know. Okay. But we're going to focus mostly on six today. So, so Kevin, how about you start off by reading that to us? Let's just dig right into it. Yeah, so so the first thing is you said we're doing a series on Christology, which is fun because we're actually doing a series on hermeneutics. Oh, we are. But but remember, <laughs> but it's like the same thing. <laughs> yeah, right. like the cool thing is you're not wrong. <laughs> I know. So um, I just completely messed up our own series that we're yeah. doing, which is great without because that's the right way to mess it up at all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. So hermeneutics. It, if people haven't been listening to all the the hermeneutics series yet, um, go back and re-listen to some, but. But that's exactly the point, is that we are intentionally and unapologetically reading Scripture from a Christological point of view, focused on Christ, um, as He is the fulfillment of the Scriptures, He is the goal of the Scriptures, and He is really the reason we read Scripture, is is the person and work of Jesus Christ as God's gift of salvation to sinners. So that's what we'll do. So Exodus 34. This is verse six, and, and of course, we'll, we'll talk about context and all those things, but this is verse six. The Lord passed before him, that'd be Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And that is, first of all, Many, many people have called this the most important text in the Old Testament, hmm. that this verse is actually the summation of the entire Old Testament theology, and, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, some people even say that this is the Old Testament equivalent of John 3.16, so this is the verse that kind of distills all the theology of the Old Testament into one little passage. And huh. yeah, exactly. Historically, huh. would you find Jews quoting this one the way Christians today quote John 3.16? Like, was it used in that way? Well, that's the interesting thing is, is when you understand the importance of this passage, you actually see this being quoted or alluded to throughout the rest of the Old Testament. So oh. in some ways, yes, this actually, this verse ties together the rest of the Old Testament. Um, some will even suggest that this verse frames the writing and the compilation of the books hmm. of the Old Testament. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting study on this and a lot of work that goes into those kinds of things. We won't spend a lot of time talking about that. But, but what that means is that this verse is very important to understand as it stands as kind of a summary of the Old Testament theology. And it plays an important role, like I said, in the rest of the, the writing of the Old Testament. But, but it specifically, it plays a very important role then in the Torah, the first five books of Moses. And what this means is as we read the Bible Christologically, that that an, an, a passage of this importance is necessarily going to be important for us 
as Christians and how we understand the Bible to be fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus. So this is what we're going to spend just a real brief time today working on is how do we read this verse in its original setting in the book of Exodus, in the story of the Torah, but also in an an overall view of the Old Testament and most importantly, as it points us to Jesus Christ and as it finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And then remember, when we talk about things being fulfilled in Jesus in Christology, we talk about not just Jesus as an idea, but specifically then his role as our savior, his perfect Mm -hmm. life, his suffering, death, resurrection, ascension, and then finally will be second coming. Right. So another thought I had as, as you're summarizing that is, I could see how somebody who well, maybe maybe this is because I perhaps misstated when I'd say that this passage is actually about Jesus. Maybe that's not quite accurate of me to say it that way because Jesus isn't mentioned here. And so I can see how somebody might come to the Old Testament and say, look, Jesus isn't mentioned. Why are you bringing him up? Why are you talking about him? Why is that relevant to this passage? You're just eisegeting him into that. That is, you're Mm -hmm. reading him into the text. You're forcing Jesus in there when he isn't actually there. The author wasn't thinking about Jesus when he wrote this. You know, Moses, when he's writing this account, isn't thinking about Jesus. Um, I I bring up these questions now because we're going to talk about other Old Testament passages throughout this hermeneutic series as well. And so this is an important potential objection to, to address and what what is it that we're actually doing when we do this? Right, and that's why this this passage is kind of one we chose to kind of do this with in the beginning of, of some of these passages. So just remembering the passage itself, it says the Lord, and, and remember the way that our English Bibles look, the Lord is in all small caps there. So mm-hmm. that's probably the Hebrew word Yahweh behind that. So the Lord passed before Moses, so we'll talk about what that means, and proclaimed. So the so God himself is actually speaking, and he proclaims his name twice, Yahweh, Yahweh. And then he says, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And the reason this this passage is so important is because this is the most explicit description of God's character. Hmm. Before this, we've had several passages that describe God's name and something that he does. You think of the burning bush where Moses learns God's name, where God says, I will be what I will be. Right, mm-hmm. and and he and he's kind of asked, "Who should I say sent me?" And you say, "I am sent me," and all that kind of stuff. You have Exodus th- six where that's kind of recapitulated. You have Exodus twenty then, which is often seen as a parallel to this. So Exodus twenty, which is the giving of the Ten Commandments, but the, remember the Ten Commandments start. Well, we can turn there and look real quickly. If we just look at Exodus chapter twenty. You'll you'll note that the Ten Commandments, which it starts with verse one, so it's easy, <laughs> right? So Exodus twenty is the, t- the giving of the Ten Commandments, and it starts at verse one, and it's very similar to our passage because it says, "And the Lord spoke these words, saying." So once we can have God Himself speaking, and it starts off with with the proclamation of God's name, "I am the Lord your God," but then look what it says next: "Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery." or out of a slave house, depending mm-hmm. how you want to read that. Yep. But again, the Lord's name here is accompanied with a description of his work. It's not until Exodus 34, then, that we understand God's character. And, and I'll also note real quick, the book of Genesis is full of examples once also of God's work. Here is God right. stepping in and actively doing things. And, and you can see what he's doing but yeah he's not describing himself in any particular way his character throughout those encounters you just see here is what god is doing you see his works on display yeah so now we have god describing his character which actually describes why he's done these works 
and why he's going to treat Israel the way he's going to treat Israel moving forward. And so this is why this passage becomes such an important passage for Old Testament theology, for the writings of the Old Testament, and really then, and this is kind of what, what you were talking about earlier, it also moves us to look for where do we see a full revelation of the character of God. Hmm. And that's where this verse actually is talking about Jesus. Okay. Because the New Testament teaches us that Jesus himself is a revelation of God. Yeah, we've both we've had his a, actions and his character. We we've spoken in previous podcast episodes specifically about the Gospel of John tying Yahweh to Jesus. And right. and how and, you have that direct connection in many places in the Old Testament. And so you even have that in the works of Paul as well, as well, where Paul will equate the term in the Old Testament Yahweh with the person of Jesus in the New Testament, and say, and we'll look at this in a second, in like in Romans chapter nine, where he equates the two. So the first thing I want to do is um, remember in the Old Testament this statement. If <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing, um, because if you look at thirty-four verse one. The Lord said to Exodus 34, verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. Uh oh. <laughs> it's, this starts off not so good, right? Yeah. Because you have to remember what came before this. Chapter 20 was where we had the first. Yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly right. So the giving of the first two tablets of stone and the question is why do we need a second came down the mountain and there was this calf thing going on yeah and moses, exactly moses kind of lost it <laughs> and he smashes the tablet <laughs> yep, right so yep. so this is god now this is very important listen to this this is god describing who he is in light of what israel has done when they made a golden calf and literally broke his commandments hmm. i mean moses literally broke yeah the 10 commandments into pieces on the ground because israel was worshiping a false god hmm. of their own making so in response to that this is what god says i'm a god merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And we learn that the most important thing that we can know about God is that he forgives our sins because of his mercy and love, not because of anything that we have done, mm -hmm. but because of the character of God himself being merciful and gracious and loving. Right, now that you've framed it that way, I'm already thinking of various New Testament passages. All of them are Paul that are coming to mind because Paul talks about this a lot, but just the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were yes. dead in our trespasses and sins, um, and Christ died for us. It's like uh, over and over, it's like you, you, are, you are a sinner. While you are that sinner... God is doing this. Christ is dying for you and he's saving you. You didn't change first and then God did this. We're seeing the same thing here in Exodus, this exact same picture of God. Yeah. That's exactly right. And and what we see then is that this is the God in whom Israel is called to put their trust. Hmm. Trust in this God who is characterized by mercy and graciousness, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Trust in this God to be the God who saves you, the God who takes care of you, and to be your God. So now, we're running out of time, so let's let's go to the <laughs> New Testament real quick. And just trust me in some of this. We don't have time to work all this out kind of specifically. But go to John chapter 1. You, you knew we'd go to John, right? Well, of course. I mean, we're, we're always going to end up in one. John the best gospel to go to <laughs> this is so, a podcast with kevin we're going to end up, in, right. John end up in john point. at some point so john chapter one and this is this is pretty much agreed upon in scholarship is that john chapter one especially uh verses 16 through 17 
are really a description that that uh, alludes back to the episode we just read because prior to the verses in Exodus 34, at the end of Exodus 33 is where Moses asked to see God and was told no one can see God and live. And so he was hid in the cleft of the rock and he saw God as he passed by. And this, the, the what we just read was actually what God proclaimed when he passed by. Hmm. Okay. And... So now let's read, with all that in mind, let's read John 1, 16 to 18. And this is what John's talking about Jesus here. And it says, from his fullness, from Jesus's fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay, now just listen to those those terms, grace and truth, grace upon grace, and listen again to Exodus 34. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. See, these are very, very similar terms, very, very similar descriptions of God. And in, in, I'm reading from the NASB, and in the NASB, in the Exodus passage, it actually says loving kindness and truth. Mm-hmm. Instead of mm-hmm. steadfast love and faithfulness, That's right. so That's there's right. even it, it, there's an even clearer one to one correlation in in the translation I've got in front of me. Yes, and, and it's even clearer when you look at original languages. So, yeah. so that's absolutely accurate. Now, now, just don't forget if you want to lend more credence to this, this parallels, look at verse eighteen. No one has ever seen God. Remember, Moses said, "Can I see you?" And God said, "No, you can't." <laughs> Right, But listen to this. No one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Now, the one who is at the Father's side is Jesus. Mm -hmm. He is the one who is uniquely God, who is at the Father's side, and who came to make God the Father known. That's the rest of the Gospel of John, is how Jesus did that. But now, put this all together with Exodus 34. Listen to this. From Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. That goes back to Exodus 20 and 34. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, who is grace and truth but Yahweh? Hmm. See, in Exodus 34, Yahweh is grace and truth. And now we receive grace and truth through Jesus. So listen, no one's ever seen God, but Jesus, who is the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made the Father known. So when you want to know who God is, according to the Gospel of John, look at Jesus. And when you see Jesus, you see God with the very same ideas that Exodus 34 teaches us are the primary characteristics of Yahweh himself. Okay. And I have one question as we're, as we're wrapping up. Um, and we are going to wrap up quickly here because Kevin and I are trying to do shorter episodes so that we can try and record more of them and get them out mm-hmm. more regularly for you guys. Uh, hopefully it also gets us to the point quicker uh, in those episodes, and we're doing a little more fast pace. So uh, that that's our references to running out of time. But how we 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 can see this now because we have the New Testament. Mm-hmm. We're we're looking back. Is that the only way that you can see this? That we could see this in Exodus is because. We can now see it through the lens of Jesus. I, I'm trying to figure out how how critical is is that as we're reading Scripture. Is is this really something that could not be seen apart from Christ? I and mean, that's kind of what Paul went through. <laughs> so, so the answer is yes and no. Um, the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament believers, believed that this was the characteristic of Yahweh, and they kept looking for it. They kept longing for it. Hmm. Um, They knew that there was a separation between them and God because of their sin. So you have uh, the struggle with with the monarch, the kingdom, right, where they were worshiping false gods at times, and God finally punished them in the exile. And so in the minor prophets, you really see this characteristic of God being the thing that ties together the prophets, is that even in light of our sins, even though we're in exile, we're still going to trust in this God who is a God of unfailing love, of steadfast faithfulness. The, the, the word in Hebrew is chesed. Mm-hmm. 
Hmm. Okay. When you look at the Psalms, this is this is the theme of the Psalms, is that the psalmist is always crying out to the God of steadfast love. I was gonna mention that because right at the beginning when we read that, I'm like, this is all over the Psalms. You know, yes. Loving kindness if you're in the King James or the NASB, steadfast love if you're in the ESV. Like it's just it's all over the place. And I've learned to read that as, oh, he's talking about Jesus. <laughs> right. And that's exactly right. So so the answer to your question is, we now know the name of the one who was steadfast love in the flesh. Hmm. We now know the name of the one who is God's, remember, both God's action and his character in one revelation. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, with all that in mind, listen to the verse that you know like the back of your hand. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is who God is. Mm -hmm. He's the God who loves. How does he love? Mercifully, graciously, steadfastly, rejoicing to forgive sins. How does he do that? In his son, Jesus Christ. But wait, there's more. Because, like you were saying earlier, the sentence doesn't stop. Exodus 34 doesn't stop (laughs) at verse 6, right? The sentence doesn't stop there because it goes on. And this is the scary part of the verse. It says, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And we're like, this is great. And then it says, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Jesus comes not just to present God as this generically loving God, but to, but to bring the love of God to sinners by dying in order to forgive sins. He actually conquers our sin. Our sin is judged in Jesus. See, Jesus comes as the revelation of the fullness of God, not just the gospel side of God, but the fullness of God, also his law, also his justice. And so when Christ lived the perfect life, he lived it so that there was no wrath upon him. But when he went to the cross, he willingly took the wrath that everybody deserves, the fathers, the children, from generation to generation, all of it on Jesus. And he says, now, I've swallowed up all of that wrath. I've swallowed up all that sin on the cross, in my suffering, in my death, in my perfect life. It's all on me. And now he gives to us who God truly is, the God of compassion and kindness. So now when we come before God in Jesus' name, the God that we come before is one who receives us with grace and mercy and forgiveness. And, and that is the God that we can trust in, the God that we can hope in, the God that we repent to because he always forgives us. Mm. And that is the crucial conversation, this, this conversation about God in Christ Jesus. Uh, I, I love, we're, as we wrap up here, I, I love how we've taken this Old Testament passage and given one of the most famous verses ever even more depth. And, and not only have we been able to understand the Old Testament better through Christ, but we've then taken that Old Testament, pushed it forward into the New Testament, and understood the New Testament better as well. That's right. Because it's all about Jesus from front to back. So yep. we're, we're going to continue doing this. Um, Kevin, any, any suggestions for passages next time? What do, what do you got in mind that we're going to cover next? Well, I don't. You're I not don't committing us passage. to it. You're not, I'm not committing, committing us to it. <laughs> I, I think we want to look at some psalms as we go, okay. because we're going to look at different parts of the Old Testament. This was a narrative, and so one of the things I want to encourage people is that as they read this passage is, is to also see then that the action of God to save His people in the Exodus that action itself becomes a prophecy of His action to save His people mm-hmm. in Christ. So, so this is how we're reading the Old Testament now: is, is we see these things that God did to save His people as real events that happened in history and prophecies of a greater fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at other parts of the Old Testament. So like when we look at the book of Psalms, 
And we're going we're gonna to do that. We're going to look at a couple of Psalms maybe, or maybe a couple of passages from some Psalms and talk about how they describe, yes, David as the king of Israel, but more importantly, how they're fulfilled in Christ as the king of the Jews, yeah. how, how Jesus comes and fulfills that messianic role. All so right. We'll so that. stick around in this series on hermeneutics which just happens to be highly, highly Christological, which is why I forget which series we're in, um, because we're going to continue doing this, and hopefully with these shorter episodes, we'll be able to record more and make it a somewhat weekly kind of thing. That's our goal. Hopefully we can uh, stick to that, because there's just so much going on. (laughs) Thanks for joining us today. Thanks. See ya.